Welcome back to our track on open source in the public sector. We will have a couple of lightning talks and then one more in-depth talk on the Ipsy CIS project. And then we will close with a panel discussion where you can also ask questions to the speakers in the lightning talks. We won't have very much time for that, but at the end, um, there will be time for a bit of Q&A. So with that, Kai, welcome. Thanks, Mirko. So um, welcome here in this room. And so I'm happy to uh, tell you a little about what I think are the opportunities to strengthen digital sovereignty um, and which opportunities are there. So I'm really happy to be here, uh, by the way, because I just arrived yesterday in the afternoon. So it took me about three days to get here. So I, I started my journey on Saturday night and I came here yesterday in the afternoon. So I now know a lot about Austria, which I didn't know before. So these little villages and all this kind of stuff. But yeah, unfortunately, this was, this was not my plan. So I missed two days of this very a uh, nice conference, unfortunately. But so, yeah, luckily I'm here now today. And I'm working for the uh, PD Berater der Öffentlichen Hand, which is a fully government-owned consulting company in Germany, uh, doing only projects with uh, government agency, mostly in Germany. I have a very special client, which is the Cyprus government. So I'm also working with them from time to time. Uh, but before that, of course, I have a long history of working with uh, several different clients from industry and, of course, public sector in the area of digital transformation, so uh, ranging from architecture development, uh, governance models, business models, and so currently I'm very much involved in the topic of digital sovereignty uh, with the uh, Ministry of the Interior, for example, but also then, also, of course, helping some specific agencies like FITCO in Germany, like Sendis, uh, helping them getting up to speed and really building these new entities, which then, of course, deal with the pressing issues about open source software and digital sovereignty. Now, <clears throat> when we look at the challenges, and this is, of course, where we maybe should start, uh, many of these risks will be very familiar to you, like the geopolitical risk, yeah, so that's we've got some instability. We may not trust maybe the uh, software vendors we have been working with in the past in the same way we, do, we did before. And, uh, of course, we have uh, some specifically European challenges like, um, yeah, the cloud services, we all know about this, the AI, so, and we can debate about how far has Europe developed within the AI sector, so you can, you can easily uh, debate about it and discuss it and be of different opinion, but at the end of the day, there's a certain risk involved. I think that's something we uh, can, be, can, can <clears throat> agree upon. Then, of course, uh, again, the heavy reliance on non-European technology providers, market dominance of a few firms, which is even inherit, inherited of the platform economy, of course, which then um, somehow um, provides a, uh, an advantage for those who have the biggest platform at the end of the day. And then at the end of the day, we need to talk about the data of sovereignty, so also where will our data sit, where it will be processed, and who has access to it. Now, given all these challenges, um, <clears throat> the European Union says Europe's ability to act independently in the digital world is their definition of digital sovereignty. And uh, the German ET plan start really <clears throat> uh, put in more detail around it and said, okay, for us, it's basically um, <clears throat> that the institutions can fulfill their, their role in the digital world independently, self-determined and securely. So this is basically the framework that we're using when we're talking about digital sovereignty for the German government. And this is our, these are our guiding principles, so to speak. And so we break them down into uh, three <coughs> abilities. There's an ability to switch. So that's, you have the choice. You're not really bound to one vendor, to one technology. You have the ability to, ch to choose. A design capability, so you have influence on that solution, you can really under, um, support it or understand it from the ground up, so while it's being built. And you have, and sorry for this one here, so just get rid of this one. Um, <clears throat> you have an, some sort of influence on the provider. So it's not a monopoly you're dealing with. So somehow you have a choice, you have influence, you can really um, yeah, bring your own interest to the table and it's being regarded as being important and to be, uh, to be really built into the solutions at the end of the day. So. And this ended up in uh, a paper that is quite old, yeah, from 2021. This was published by the German government. It's the paper on digital sovereignty and what the German government understands or defines, specifically the Ministry of the Interior, 
um, as approaches and measures that could be taken to address uh, the issue of uh, digital sovereignty. And many of these have been kicked off. Yeah, so many of these are up and running, and some of them you may be even familiar with. And I want to highlight a few of them. And uh, also some of them have, have been mentioned in uh, other speeches before this one in more detail, so I don't want to go into too much of the details here. Um, my point here is to show that it makes sense to set up such a program, to look at it in this way, in this holistic way, and really see where can we really do something about it. So which are the measures we should take to strengthen our digital sovereignty for our countries, for Europe? And this is what I want to show you. And I only want to go into um, five of these different dimensions <clears throat> and start just with the Sovereign Tech Fund. Sovereign Tech Fund, you have heard about, they had 195 uh, technologies identified worthy of inv invest <clears throat> investing in. And as uh, Thomas already said, 15 million have already been spent, 40 projects have been funded, and uh, you see this little QR code there, you can find them there, all the details. Uh, but what I find uh, a very encouraging and uh, yeah, thing to happen, so that this is currently running for quite a while. So this program has been there, I don't know for how many years, but I think that started in 22 years, yeah, 22. So you can see these things are even sustainable. Yeah, they don't go away. And it is maybe worth thinking about, should we do this for a longer time? Should we put more money into this? And another one, and uh, this is Julian's thing here. He is amongst us here. Uh, open Code provides a powerful platform for open source projects. So really for the collaboration of open source projects in the government sector. But of course, uh, everybody can use it, but mainly it was built to really support this um, effort to uh, build, provide a platform for open source project in the um, public sector. And there are many projects on there, like uh, Thomas was saying before. So I think we have more than 1,000 projects, more than 5,000 users, and, and this is good. So we see this growing over time, but it's of course not yet there where it should be or where it wants to be. So there's still a lot of work ahead. And it is very important that this is being supported by government agencies, by the people who contribute here. And of course, it needs some funding. Um, oh, sorry, that was too fast. Then there are some examples what is on this platform. And they are really good examples. So if you go to these different uh, web pages, you can see that these are applications which are really production worthy. It's nothing, it's, it's not playground. It's really something you can use in your daily work. And it's amazing what's, what's on there. Another thing that's currently happening, so it's more paying on that element of uh, having a German government cloud strategy or even having a German government cloud service available. This has just very recently been closed, the contract between uh, the company who's doing it now for Graf Digital, which is the, um, say, organization who is in charge of providing these multi-cloud hybrid services. So what it can do then is fully manage access to cloud services, strengthened, of course, digital sovereignty, because you have got choice. That's one of the dimensions I mentioned before. You have the choice to choose between those five, this may, but this may change over time. So whenever there comes a provider who provides a service which is valuable to the government, this can be put under this umbrella and can be made consumable for all the government agencies. Um, then the next point is, we could, what we could do as well is, of course, strengthen the procurement. Our government procurement in the sense that they are aware of <clears throat> what digital sovereignty means, um, what the contribution of open source software can be to this. And um, so there are some uh, angles that we, that we approach it. Um, that's, for example, Kaufhaus des Bundes, which is a central buying agency for the um, federal ministries. We've got this VBIS, so the economic viability analysis you have to do for every project in the government. Yes, you have to show that it's viable, that it's really worth doing it. And so we are bringing this element of digital sovereignty into it. And then, uh, of course, the general contract and pol procurement policies, which are also important when government agencies go for a procurement. <clears throat> so at that point, we ask some questions. And these are just examples of questions you could ask when you want to make sure that at least there has been a thought has been spent 
on digital sovereignty in the procurement process. So, finally, what do we need to do? Secure the funding, of course, OSS projects, but also the other supporting measures. Create awareness for the necessity and viability of the digital sovereign solutions. So it's really about the people. Yeah? We have to really inform people about it. We have to give them some, some food for thought so that they understand why it's important. Jointly develop and implement impactful policies yeah, to foster that digital sovereignty and push forward with the activities to strengthen digital sovereignty, as we have seen. So there are many, and we have to make sure that they don't die, that they go on. That's very important, and that's, I think, also one reason why we're here. And so, um, yeah, I hope you also will support this way forward and um, we make good progress in the area of digital sovereignty. Thanks for listening.